China celebrates 70 years after the peaceful liberation of Tibet. We will take a look at what's changed there. Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu and this is The Heat. In 1951, the agreement of the Central People's Government and the local government of Tibet on measures for the peaceful liberation of Tibet was signed in Beijing. It marked the peaceful liberation of Tibet and started a completely new and historical process for the advancement of Tibetan society. Since then, living standards have drastically improved for people in the region and the development was coupled with preserving their culture and heritage. CGTN's Huang Yue has more from Beijing. From developing the economy to preserving culture and protecting the local ecosystem, officials from China's Tibet Autonomous Region say the past seven decades have brought tremendous changes to the plateau. Regional GDP increased from 129 million yuan in 1951 to 190 billion yuan in 2020, an increase of over 300 times in terms of comparable prices. In Tibet, 15 years of free education are now offered. The social security system covering urban and rural residents has been established. Average life expectancy has been extended to over 71 years. Known as the roof of the world, Tibet has an average altitude of over 4,000 meters above sea level. The mountainous terrain means it used to be difficult to travel to the region. But now, Tibet's party secretary Wu Yinjie says 140 domestic and international air routes link the region to 66 cities, and a comprehensive transport network composed of highways, railways and air routes has been established since 1951. Officials say efforts to protect and pass on the distinctive Tibetan culture have also been a top priority over the years. The regional chairman says Tibet has been identified as a unique area for cultural protection and that great support has been offered to enrich and refine its traditions and cultures. It's come in the form of policies, funding, technology and talent. The state and autonomous region have invested more than 5 billion yuan to protect and construct 55 key national cultural relics and more than 610 regional cultural relics. The officials also note that freedom of religious belief is fully protected in Tibet and religious work has won support from the faithful. Every time Tibet is mentioned, people conjure images of blue skies, snow-capped mountains and lucid waters. Environmental protection of the Qinghai Tibet Plateau is not only important for China, but also the world. People call Tibet the water tower of Asia for a reason. Officials say ecosystems are generally stable in Tibet now, but they will continue to pay very close attention to the impact brought about by global warming. As the plateau region has so many glaciers and snowy mountains, it's quite sensitive to climate change. Huang Yue, CGTN, Beijing. Let's bring in our panel right now from Beijing via Skype. Victor Gao is a chair professor at Suqiao University. Also from Beijing via Skype, Shindo Xu is host of CGTN's Dialogue Weekend. Here in Washington, D.C. via Skype, John Gong is a professor of economics at the University of International Business and Economics. And with us in our studio, Sean Caleb's is a CGTN correspondent. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And Victor, let me start with you in Beijing. As we have been reporting, it has been 70 years since the signing of that peace accord between the Tibetan Army and the People's Liberation Army in 1951. So take us back. What was the significance of that accord and what changed for Tibet at that time? Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, for hundreds of years, uh, Tibet has been part of China. Uh, actually, it has been part of China for more than 1,000 years. And uh, then in the early part of the 20th century, we know there, is, there was great turmoil and uncertainty in China, a war of aggression by foreign countries, for example. And uh, uh, the British Empire in India was very much eager to infiltrate into Tibet. And uh, uh, Tibet gradually kind of uh, spinned away from the central government. And uh, uh, therefore, in 1951, this peaceful accord for the peaceful liberation of Tibet 
was a very important part to very uh, eloquently and very effectively bring Tibet very much back to China's sovereignty. So this is the first starting point. Now, then, after uh, th 70 years, the progress in Tibet is easy for everyone to see, everyone with decency of mind, uh, going to Tibet will come to the conclusion that Tibet has been very much improved and transformed. Now, over the past several decades, what was controversial from the Western perspective was about whether the Tibetan culture, religion, uh, language, etc., were uh, preserved and protected. Absolutely, yes. Why? Because the Tibetan culture and religion and uh, a language were very much part of the overall Chinese civilization. We need to protect them, and not only for ourselves, but for mankind as a whole. So I would say if you apply a level of objectivity to the transformation in Tibet, it is for everyone's benefit. Everyone in Tibet, Tibetans, non-Tibetans in Tibet, for example, have really flourished over the past 70 years. Allow me to single out the longevity of the life expectancy. It has more than doubled over the past 70 years. And Tibetans living in Tibet are much better off than uh, Tibetans or other similar uh, ethnic groups in other parts of Asia, in India, in Bhutan, in Nepal, in uh, Kashmir region, for example. So this is really a very important achievement, and we need to celebrate the great transformation and great progress in Tibet for everyone's knowledge. Let's talk about the real truth in Tibet, and it is a much better, much improved Tibet for everyone's benefit. John Gong, of course, we've seen enormous economic and social changes in Tibet over the last 70 years. As Victor Gao just uh, reminded us, life expectancy has doubled, per capita disposable income has doubled, and we've even seen a significant increase in income among the rural population in Tibet. So put that in the broader context of China's uh, evolution uh, over the past 40 years, say, into the economic powerhouse it is today. Yeah, um, well, I think uh, Victor made the very good uh, analogies, uh, make good comparisons between people living in Tibet with the people in other parts of Asia near Tibet. Uh, I think a more appropriate uh, comparison would be comparing Tibetans' life living in Tibet uh, with the exiled Tibetans living in, uh, say, uh, Dharamsha in India. These are the people who uh, uh, left uh, Tibet uh, in the 1950s. Then, uh, if you look at the GDP figure on uh, per capita basis, um, it, it, Tibetans living in Tibet have a GDP uh, three times more than the average GDP in uh, uh, Dharamsala, for example. Um, and then, of course, you know, Tibetan's development is part of the overall picture uh, in China. You know, we have made great strides over the years. Uh, China's economic size has greatly expanded. And we never left behind Tibet. I mean, if you look at the GDP per capita uh, in Tibet with other parts of China, it's actually not a very large difference here. I, I, if I remember this correctly, uh, Tibet's uh, autonomous region's GDP per capita is about 80 percent of the national average, which is about you know $10,000 uh, uh, per capita basis, which is actually not bad. I mean, look at the uh, the economic difference in 1951. It was was a lot of difference, right? Uh, uh, and and on top of this, I think what's more worth mentioning is the entire uh, infrastructure China has brought to uh, Tibet. You know, in terms of building railways, highways, airports, electricity supply network, grid. Um, the water supply, you know, there, there's a world of difference. Uh, I'll just give you one example. In 1952 or 1953, I can't remember exactly, Dalai Lama, who, you know, who is the current Dalai Lama living in India right now, in, in, in Damsha, he took a trip to Beijing. Now, it took him almost a month just to um, travel from uh, Lhasa, which is the capital city at that time, and still the capital city in Tibet right now, just to the border of uh, Tibet with the rest of China, you know, just to travel, spend a whole month traveling between uh, Lhasa to walk out of Tibet. Uh, today, it took, it took, and it takes about a day. You know, we have a, we have a train that uh, travels to Tibet. 
uh, and it's, 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 a, it's, it's a really engineering feat in my view. It's very difficult terrain to build a railway in that area. Um, but we did it uh, several years ago. So I think you know, there's a world of a difference that have taken place in Tibet. Um, and uh, you know, people in Tibet, uh, they're living a much, much happier life and a much, much longer life. Shinde Xu, our reporter at the beginning of the show was talking about Tibet's cultural heritage. It's a, it's a rich cultural heritage. Um, tell us about that and how it has been preserved and promoted over the years. Well, uh, Tibetan culture, just like uh, you know, another, you know, other ethnic cultures in China, um, obviously this is important to be part of the Chinese culture. Uh, so you can see, uh, I think there is a full understanding of the preservation and protection of the ethnic cultures, including uh, the, ethnic, the Tibetan cultures, uh, to be part of the Chinese culture. So if you look at the past, uh, you know, 70 uh, years over there, I would say you mentioned about the 40 years in particular of the reform and opening up. I, I do agree. I think that because of the, uh, you know, poverty alleviation efforts and uh, economic improvement, uh, living standard improvement in Tibet, it's actually easier. You can see the central government and also the local government, they are investing more uh, in the preservation, protection of culture and uh, religions in Tibet. Either it's about the size, uh, about uh, this, uh, you know, Buddhist uh, practice, uh, practice size of their you know, hundreds of them, several hundreds of them. So it's well protected because there's a need and people fully understanding this uh, cultural significance, not only within China, but also internationally. So uh, I would say 40 years, uh, uh, this recent 40 years or 20 years, uh, probably you see more improvement uh, in terms of protection of the culture over there. Over there. Okay, let's bring it right here to the studio. With me is CGTN correspondent Sean Caleb. Sean, you have covered this region extensively, visited China several times, many times. You've luck been lucky enough to travel to Tibet as well. Uh, let's look at one of your reports from Tibet. <laughs> 15-year-old Daiwa Bamu is working towards something her parents could never dream of, a formal education. My favorite subject is biology. I think we have less grass here, but more yaks to feed in my hometown. The grass is not rich enough, so I want to study to help the grass thrive. A noble goal in a society that has always revolved around yak and the nomadic way of life. This school is one of a growing number in Tibet that also labels itself bilingual, meaning students learn Mandarin and Tibetan in an effort to help preserve their rich culture. <laughs> Bama Danzong has been teaching the Tibetan language here for nearly a decade. <laughs> Studying Tibetan language is of great importance for the students and their parents. After graduation, they could serve the people in the Tibetan area. It's a common sight in middle schools throughout China, students lining up for the daily workout. China has made education and poverty alleviation key in this region, which means attention to Mandarin. But in recent years, the focus has been on Tibetan tradition and culture as well. From the whole Tibet Autonomous Region to our school, we all attach great importance to bilingual teaching. The common language is Mandarin. In our country, it is widely used in every way, such as finding a job. But governments in different levels also give lots of attention on Tibetan culture protection. Tibet is changing. There is construction, development, and more nomadic people are voluntarily relocating to cities and larger towns for better housing and the promise of better jobs. For Dawa Baimu, one more reason to preserve her culture. People seldom know about our culture now, so I want to be a Tibetan language teacher when I grow older, so I can pass down our culture. This facility really is a boarding school. Students like Dawa stay here for weeks at a time, hours away from their families. While the library boasts a selection of Tibetan topics, Dawa says she wrestles with the pangs of being homesick. When I feel sad, I will look up at the blue sky. I will feel that the sky is so big. Why am I feeling sad? Just because of one small thing? We also have white clouds and high mountains. So when I see those snow-capped mountains, I feel relaxed and happy. And she knows she's also broadening her own horizon at the same time. Sean Caleb, CGTN, Nachu City, Tibet. So great report there, Sean. Tell us about your visit. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing to go back and look at those because you can put yourself back 
uh, in that moment. And what you have to realize, we really haven't talked about, is how high the altitude is there. And you really have to be prepared for either take medication or understand you're going to have a certain degree of discomfort. Mm -hmm. And in Lhasa, the beautiful capital, that's like at 13.5, I think, in terms of feet. Um, how many meters? You know, close to four, I guess. Yeah. And um, we had 11 people with us on that trip. And three had to eventually go back home because of altitude sickness. So it was, it was interesting. It was different. And in the story, you might have heard the girl say she gets homesick. Well, she's been separated from her parents voluntarily. She wants to go to a, a good school, learn more about science so she can go back and work in her area and work on grasses, work on making farming uh, better, a uh, better life for the people in her area. And that is something that's been you know, controversial. Certainly the West is, has, has picked on that, for lack of a better term. But a lot of these people, when you talk to them about the nomadic people who basically used to live in, in tents or areas that could be broken down, now they're living in little communities. Um, you talk to them about that change, and to a person, almost all of them say, of course we want to do this. I remember once talking to this uh, lady who lived out in the middle of nowhere, and she said, my son got sick last year. And the nearest person was like 30 kilometers away. So she couldn't leave to go get attention for her son. So she had to wait till somebody came back. And now if she lived in one of those areas, they knock across the door. Hey, can you watch my son while I take him to the, to the doctor? So there are things like that. Certainly the life is changing, but a lot of people in Tibet clearly want that. And secondly, you saw some of the construction at the start. We heard mm -hmm. one of our guests talk about the amazing construction of those trains. Well, there are a lot of endangered and threatened species in that area, the, the Tibetan antelope, the black neck crane. And the way all those things are being built, they're not disrupting the uh, pattern of migration for those animals. They're building the tracks above ground so they can run under them. They're making sure that the water supply isn't damaged uh, in the estuaries for the black neck crane. So there's a lot going on. I mean, to, look, everybody wants to go to Tibet, I'm sure. A lot of people yeah. do. And if you can go, I think you can, any of the beliefs that you may have had, I think they obviously get shaped one way or the other right. once you go there. And it, to me, it was fascinating. And, and I'd go back in a heartbeat. Certainly fascinating. And of course, there is the potential for tourism right now. We'll talk about that in a moment because of that great communications network that we see. But we are going to take a quick break right now. Stay with us. You're watching The Heat. National psyche point of view, there's a bit of panic. Oh, this thing is going to come and kill us all. There's something real comforting about knowing you're going out to help people. criticità sanitaria avranno al collasso purtroppo vedremo tante persone morire Welcome back to this edition of The Heat. We are taking a look at China's Tibet region 70 years after its peaceful liberation. Let's get back to our panel right now. And uh, Victor Gao, Tibet is, of course, an autonomous region in China. But what does that mean? Uh, what kind of autonomy does it enjoy? Well, first of all, uh, there are altogether about 31 units, including provinces and autonomous regions and uh, municipalities directly under the jurisdiction of the State Council. Tibet is one of the five autonomous regions, and the autonomous regions have a higher level of autonomy. For example, the head of the autonomous region normally is the uh, person of that particular ethnic group, and uh, uh, people in that particular region of that particular ethnic group will have a higher level of autonomy in many aspects of 
ways of life, work, etc. And uh, uh, people throughout China, altogether of 56 different ethnic groups, we are all brothers and sisters. We respect each other, we treat each other as equals, and it's the same thing for Tibetans. <clears throat> Allow me to make another point. I think for the Tibetans, they actually carry extra significance for the Chinese nation as a whole, mainly because Tibetans are very spiritual. Mm -hmm. And if you travel to Tibet, which has a higher uh, level of uh, uh, altitude above sea level, you actually feel much closer to heaven in a sense. <laughs> so I think we have a lot of reference for our brothers and sisters in Tibet, very much because of the higher level of spirituality in Tibet. Therefore, allow me to emphasize that in addition of becoming or remaining as an autonomous region, we, everyone in China of different ethnic groups, need to really do an extra job in right. helping protection the culture and religion and language of the Tibetan people. That's absolutely a must. And I hope the rest of the world will feel assured that we are doing our job and we will continue to do a very good job in this regard. Thank you. <laughs> John Gong, we were talking about tourism a moment ago. How important is tourism for Tibet? And, you know, as we saw in those pictures, and as Sean mentioned as well, you mentioned that as well, there are, there's a great uh, communications network that's been built, great land and air routes into the region. Oh, it's a beautiful area. Uh, you know, this is an area where you don't have much manufacturing at all. Uh, the economy revolves around tourism. Uh, we have built a tourism infrastructure there. For example, we have a, a train. The train actually uh, is a, a tourist train. In other words, uh, the train uh, makes several stops on the way so that people can step outside the train and take a look at the surrounding beautiful sceneries. Um, and, and we have a you know, nice airport there. We have built the, uh, the, the modern hotels there. Uh, electricity supply, these things. So we have the, the basic infrastructure there to accommodate uh, tourists. And I think uh, tourists accounts for a large portion of the GDP there. I mean, this is an area that it's ecologically preserved, uh, environmentally preserved, and that uh, we would like to remain that way. Uh, and I also want to make a note to uh, the program you just showed about that student uh, that was brought into um, uh, England, mainland China, and, you know, uh, to get education there. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have some, uh, you know, a, concept, a misconception about this kind of program, because I know this very well. I have a student like that, my PhD student. She came from a, um, a, a, a rural community, a rural farming community. Without that opportunity, she would have just been an ordinary farmer, I guess. But now she was brought to a very nice high school in Shanghai. She attended uh, the Jiao Tong University, which is like the China's MIT. Right. And now she's doing, uh, the, uh, doing the PhD work with me. I mean, that's that's like, you know, like like, like the high school here, the Thomas Jefferson High School, setting aside a, 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 a quota yeah. for some student coming from a Indian reservation in Oklahoma or South Dakota, brought them to Fairfax County, Virginia, yeah. and gave her a, a nice education. I mean. We're talking about that kind of a program. So right. I, I, I think we shouldn't have this kind of misconception about a program like that. Okay. Shindashu, there are something like 600 religious figures in Tibet who serve as legislators. They serve as advisors, political advisors as well. What can you tell us about the role they play and religious freedom in the region? Well, that's a part of the tradition. Uh, if you go to Tibet, if you go to um, the religious sites, so often is the case. You see... Uh, young people, actually, young monks. And uh, so they work in the religious sites. And this is a part of their life. Uh, some would choose to be, you know, spend and devote their whole life to religion. Uh, some would play a very important role in help running the places uh, the, or the cities or the uh, villages over there. Uh, so in, in probably for for for, that, for for hundreds of years or thousands of years, that's a way of life. Even today, some young people would choose to be that. You know, if they choose this is my life, then they do that. And uh, so right. uh, you can see, you know, some other young people probably have their other aspirations. They want to go to Beijing or Shanghai to pursue their own uh, personal uh, career development. And I mean, it's it's really up to the young people, up to their family. Sean, these stories you've been telling us about your trip there as a correspondent are fascinating stories. But what can you tell us about your ordinary interactions with Tibetans? To me, that's what I take back. I mean, the yeah. scenery, everybody knows the scenery is amazing. But I think that in picking up on what our last guest was talking about, I think everybody looks at the Tibetans, whether they be uh, the monks, uh, 
or just the regular people walking around, there's a certain degree of reverence and a certain degree of respect because it's a very difficult life mm -hmm. uh, up there. And the people are kind and sweet almost to a fault. And I think back, we went to one elementary school where kids were beginning to learn and then they had the potential to go on to one of the high schools and they'd never seen a white foreigner. And we got out of the car and it was like, wow. And they ran up and then they got like just close enough to us and stopped. And then this one kid kind of got his nerve up to wave and I waved back and then they all came running around and they were practicing their English on us. Uh -oh. These kids were learning three different languages. I couldn't even say hello in Mandarin, let alone Tibetan and yeah. then everything else. So that was amazing. And then we saw a yak farmer, um, uh -huh. a herder out in the middle of basically nowhere and just this peaceful man and then this herd would follow him everywhere he went and he had a slingshot and if one of the yak kind of got away he would just whiz and <laughs> rock go flying and hit the thing right in the tail and uh -huh. it knew to run back in. Uh -huh. And the, the, in terms of the, uh, the tr traditional outfits that people wear, we saw that being made and they would explain to us you know, why they did a certain thing. They made this paper out of this uh, grass that was poisonous to the touch, so it would eat your hands away, but they'd been making it for generations, so their hands were like leather. And they would explain, we all bought one of the little booklets to bring back, and uh, it, it, it's just so amazing to go visit those people. And again, yeah. I have to talk about the altitude, because when you're up there, mm -hmm. you know, you're concerned. And I was telling you earlier, one day, just carrying the gear up three flights of stairs back at the hotel, you know, your hands would be exhausted. And we were, um, I was, we were getting dinner, and I was scooping out some rice, and my hands started shaking. And the doctor apparently told one of our colleagues that I was sick. I'm like, I'm not sick. So he took me over, and, and he gauged my blood pressure, my oxygen level, my heartbeat. And they were all really, really good. And he looked at me and goes, are you an athlete? I'm like, look at the size of me. I'm not an athlete. But he was, you know, it's just everybody up there just seems so concerned that you enjoy, experience, and learn about the way of life uh, right. out in that area. So it was just phenomenal. And very quickly, i got 30 seconds. Yak is the main source of food, right? <laughs> Yak is the source of food. <laughs> I mean, there are rivers everywhere. And I yeah. asked one of the farmers, like, do you ever eat the fish? And mm. I'm like, no, 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 no. And, you know, there's some belief that, you know, the reincarnation, they could yeah. come back as fish. And, and they would maybe kill one or two yak a whole season. And that would feed them for the year. And it was dry, but there was yak butter, yak milk. Uh, they would make this yogurt uh, that was very, very sour, but they would heap on sugar uh -huh. and we would eat that. But the dried yak, you have to get used to that. It was there <laughs> what sustained them, but it, it was rough. It's an acquired taste. Acquired yeah. taste. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. And thanks to all of you for being with us. Great show, thank you. And that is it for this edition of The Heat, but the conversation continues online. Join us on CGT in America's Facebook page to comment on this or any other show. Or chat with us on Twitter at CGT in America. I'm Arland Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching. <laughs>